Welcome back to Selling Your Business with David King. I'm David King, and I am the author of Selling Your Business, Begin with the End in Mind, available on Amazon. Today, I am joined by my guest, Rod Hatley, an estate planning and asset protection attorney. Rod, welcome. Thank David. It's an honor to be with you this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Rod is going to tell us a bit about what his work is working with business owners and helping them to weave in their, their estate plan, which is something everyone under the sun should have. Right. Uh, but in particular, people who own businesses need to plan for the succession of their business or the protection of the assets that they might derive from the sale of their business. So, Rod, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and sure. what you do today? Okay. Uh, well, I'm from Memphis originally, so I came to California years ago with the Navy JAG Corps. So if any of your viewers ever saw the movie A Few Good Men, that's what I used to do. I was a criminal defense attorney representing uh, sailors and Marines at courts martial. And how I got into estate planning was a very personal story. Uh, my father had been a successful businessman, but... What happened was dad had leukemia. And so at that point in his life, he was making emotional as opposed to rational decision, decisions. And you can understand why. And so dad had done some basic estate planning. He had a will, et cetera. But I knew he needed to do more. But as I say, I was a criminal defense attorney in the Navy JAG Corps. I knew enough about estate planning to be dangerous. So long story short, uh, dad passes on. I take two weeks emergency leave. I go back to Memphis and week number one, my sister and I get dad buried. And number, uh, week number two, we meet with dad's uh, business attorney who had also uh, done his estate plan, which was basically a, a very simple will. And if your viewers learn nothing else from our conversation today, wills go through probate. Now, the wrinkle here was it took us seven years to get through probate back in Memphis where I'm from. So, and I know that's not what dad wanted, but again, dad, because he was fearful and you can understand why, uh, all he had was a very simple will and wills go through probate. So in the midst of all that, I decided there had to have been a better, smarter way to have done this than what my sister and I just went through. So when I came off of active duty, I was stationed here in California, but not here in, uh, well, I, I live and practice now in San Diego, but at the time I was in the high desert of California. So what happened was, I moved from uh, the high desert down to San Diego, got an additional law degree in taxation law from the University mm -hmm. of San Diego. They've got an acclaimed graduate tax law program. Mm -hmm. And sure. then after completing that, I transitioned into private practice. And that's really what the, the focus of my practice has been for, the, for many years now, is making sure that uh, I have a conversation with clients about what their options are so we can help them get set up the right way and they can avoid a probate. So for example, in California, if you own a home, you really ought to have a living trust. And, and here's the big insight. Uh, in dad's case, his will only became effective when he died. A living trust becomes effective the moment you sign it, so it's, it's good now. Uh, so it uh, really accomplishes two important objectives. First of all, it will avoid uh, um, conservatorship. I'll pick on myself. So you know, I've done my own planning. But if, let's say, I'm driving home tonight, I get into a bad car wreck, and now I'm mentally incapacitated, um, had I not done any planning at some point, I'm going to need someone to put me in front of the probate court judge and say, Your Honor, this is Rod. He's incompetent now to manage his affairs. Please appoint me to be his conservator. And that's basically a guardian for a grown person. Um, and then, of course, someday when I pass on, assets that are in my name will go through probate. So, um, the idea of having a living trust is we put assets into it and those assets avoid conservatorship if there's any mental incapacity and then of course someday when i pass on uh, no probate because those assets will totally avoid probate altogether so anyway uh that's really why i, I wanted to transition because i thought i could make a real difference for folks uh, i enjoyed trial work it was a lot of fun but very stressful and my uh, you know the my challenge with it was I was always in a reactive mode, okay? I could, never got to be proactive. These days, I get to be proactive. I like that eminently better, and clients are happier. Um, and so it's just a lot more fun to practice law that way, to be proactive as opposed to reactive. So, 
So Rod, in your work today, sure. uh, in asset protection and est estate planning, what percentage of your clients that you work with are business owners? I'm going to say probably roughly about half of them are business owners. That's really how they've made their money uh, is through a business that they either bought if they're a franchisee or perhaps they started just to had an idea and they just took that idea and ran with it and they became successful uh, or perhaps they inherited a business from uh, their parents or grandparents or what have you. So I'd say roughly half um, will have a business of some kind and the other uh, half, you know, work for somebody else or, you know, they may be very highly compensated executive or uh, they might be a professional uh, that has perhaps partnership or equity in a, in either a practice of some kind, law practice, medical practice, et cetera. So about half and half. Half and half. Okay. And I assume that when you're working with a business owner, you need to have some understanding of the nature and operations of their business, the ownership, and those sure. sorts of basic facts about the business? Sure. And, you know, because that's going to drive a lot of the planning that we do. Um, for example, uh, if, let's say, uh, and I hope this is not true for any of your clients, but uh, I've actually worked with people who were sole proprietors. And that's okay. It's a choice and it's a very easy choice. You know, I'll just go into business for myself and I'll, you know, just be a sole proprietor. You don't have to file any paperwork. You know, you just set up shop and just go and go for it. Uh, the challenge is you're exposing yourself to unlimited personal liability. So we want to take a look at, well, how are you set up to run your business? Do you have an entity like a corporation or perhaps an LLC? And in many cases, the choice of whether you can be a corporation or an LLC is going to be driven by state law. So that will tell us whether you should be, if they are a sole proprietor, then they should consider getting an entity, whether it's a corporation or an LLC. So once we've got that in place, well then obviously there are various formalities that we have to uh, observe. You've got to file the right paperwork with the Secretary of State's office, and then there's statements of information that have to be filed on a periodic basis to keep, to make sure that the entity stays in, you know, in operation and is not sure. closed down yeah. administratively by the by the state, and then of course, um, you know, it's and so as the, uh, a client may work their business. The question then is, well, okay, what planning do you have in place? How are we going to transition this? Because you're probably not. I mean, true story. Years ago, I worked with a guy who told me he wanted to die at his desk with his boots on. I said, that's a choice. And the so, American and, nightmare. And, and, would you like to have uh, some ideas about how we could set this up so you don't have to do that? Maybe you'd like to die, you know, uh, on the beach in Hawaii with your with your toes in the sand. You know, you don't have to be at your at your desk with your boots on. So these are uh, considerations, and we're just asking clients. Well, just tell us what's important to you. Um, if they've got corporate stock, or if they've got an LLC, and so therefore they've got membership interests, we want to make sure that those items get funded into their estate plan so that we avoid probate on those uh, items because otherwise um, they may have set up a, they may have done all the necessary paperwork. They may have mm -hmm. set up the, cor the corporation or the LLC, did everything correctly, but interestingly and unfortunately they never put the stock or the membership interest into a living trust to avoid the probate. And so now we've, you know, we, we've missed an opportunity to make a successful transition uh, down to the next generation, whether it's kids or grandkids or whoever it might be. So, so I imagine you've got a fairly um, bright line between those situations where there's one owner and those where you've got multiple owners, yeah. uh, business partners who are working together, and uh, they probably have plans that if something happens to one of the owners, it's going to continue with yeah. the remaining partners. Sure. Um, are you brought into those situations so, so that you can help individuals plan incorporating those facts as well? Absolutely. And, and, and if, they, if it's more than one owner, then we ought to be having a conversation about a buy-sell agreement, probably funded with life insurance, so that, for example, a uh, couple of owners, um, one owner passes on, let's say she's married, does the other surviving owner want to be in business with the deceased owner's husband? Probably not, but because it was an asset of the estate, now the surviving husband now 
receives his deceased wife's share of the business. And so having a buy-sell agreement funded with life insurance on the life of the deceased partner allows the surviving partner to be able to buy out the husband, send him on his way. And so now uh, that uh, surviving partner can continue to run the business the way she wants to, the way that works for her, okay? So, and, and depending on how many people, how many owners you've got, there may be cross purchase agreements and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, it can get kind of, you know, uh, tricky. How do you maneuver through all this? But it's part of the conversation that we have. How are you set up and what have you got in place? If anything, if you don't have something in place, would you like to talk about how we could put something in place? Just because, yeah, I, you know, ideally we're all going to live long and fruitful lives, et cetera. But, um, you know, tomorrow is really promised to no one. So let's get out ahead of this and let's get a good plan in place, whether it's a buy-sell agreement, cross-purchase agreement, right. whatever, fund it with life insurance. And, oh, by the way, keep that insurance in force and effect. I mean, you know, right. those agreements don't do you any good if, they, yeah. if there's no money with which to buy out the, uh, the spouse of the deceased partner. So these so are all do important you, considerations. Go ahead. Do you typically represent just one of the individual owners or are you ever brought in where you can, you can also represent the, the entity that they've created? Uh, is that, a, is that a, a, not to say, is that a conflict that people can waive sure. and you can come in and help, help the entity I, I, and at the same time help one owner? Always help, always happy for the conversation, but at a certain point, it's probably better if each of the partners has their own attorney. I mean, right. you know, if, you, if you're starting off a business on a shoestring, you probably represent all of the people, but as the company grows, it becomes successful, et cetera. Now there's, you know, everybody has a certain amount of equity, et cetera. Probably a, a much better idea to, for each of the parties to have their own attorney, just so that everybody's had a, you know, the opportunity to talk about, well, what about my rights, et cetera, and get the right advice. Um, I mean, you can represent more than one person. You have to give mm -hmm. conflict waivers to do so. For example, when I do an estate plan for a married couple, uh, there is an inherent conflict of interest. So when they sign my fee agreement, they waive the conflict of interest. But um, I think it's a lot cleaner and a lot better to just say, you know what, uh, I can represent this person here. You probably need to get your own counsel and then the attorneys can work it out between them uh, for the benefit of their clients. So that's probably what I would recommend. So let's move on to the main event of succession planning. We sure. have we have a, a business and let, let's let's keep it simple. We got one owner. They built okay. it up into a successful, thriving business, okay. um, and they want to keep it in the family. What, what would be the components? And what, what are the advantageous moves to make? Uh, gifting shares along the way. What, okay. If you're taking it and drawing up a perfect plan, what would Rod Hatley recommend to a successful business owner? Yeah, it's, uh, it, well, it's a great uh, question. A lot of it's going to depend on what does the client slash owner, what does he or she want to see happen? What's important to him or her? Because once I know that, then I have some pathways to go down. Uh, I never try to put a client into a particular plan or another. I just say, look, tell me what's important. What do you want to see come out of this at the end of the day? You're gone. What does that look like and what works for you? And a lot, you know, it's not unusual. They may have, you know, perhaps family members in the business. So how do we navigate that? And, or, you know, maybe you've got one child in the business and the other kids, well, you know, I can take or leave it, but I'm not really interested. I want to go do my own thing. Okay. Well, that's another conversation to have. How do we, you know, do, do we make equalizing distributions? Let's say we give the business um, through a specific bequest to, um, you know, the one child, but then perhaps we have equalizing distributions for the other kids who don't want to be in the business, but we don't want to short them because we gave you know, the, the business over to the one child. So there are things that we can do to, you know, and, and I always tell clients, just because you treat them fairly doesn't mean it's necessarily equal. But, you know, we try to do what we can to mix and match and make sure that we're getting the right assets to the right, uh, right people, the right beneficiaries. So a lot of that is just drafting uh, the estate plan. And if, uh, and also making sure that, you know, we've done the specific bequest correctly we also want to review, well, what if it's a corporation, what does the stock say? I mean, was the stock ever transferred into the trust to begin with? 
or if we're talking about a limited liability company, were the membership interests ever transferred into the trust? You know, these are all things that we got to take a look at. And so we kind of coordinate all it together to make sure that uh, when uh, the, 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 whoever created or started the business, the founder, mm -hmm. wants to either step away or perhaps they're gone. I mean, they, you know, death came. And so suddenly they're out of the picture. How does that transition? How does that happen? How does it unfold? And does it work? Is there something that we talked to the founder about to make sure that we got his or her buy-in? Yeah, that works for me. This is how I want to see this happen. Does that make sense? It absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And look, taking as much as we can, the complicating factors out of it. If we've got one owner, a sizable enterprise, valuable enterprise, and they have um, one child, and the child is involved in the business, knowledgeable about the enterprise. Okay. Um, is there, are there instances where it can be advantageous to make gifts of shares throughout your life or sure. just leave them in the, in, the, in the estate and wait for them to pass you know, with the estate? It's a great question because we're talking about, I mean, let's, let's, let's take it from the standpoint of possibly they make, share, they make gifts of shares. Uh, you as a CPA, you know full well that uh, the, the child will get what's called carryover basis. So what that means is the child, when the gifts of stock are made to him or her by mom or dad, whoever founded the business, they get um, the stock at whatever it was worth when mom or dad founded the company. Okay? But if we wait until mom or dad has passed away and we get a step up in the basis of that stock, it's one of the few good things about dying is that you get that basis step up. So, and, and that's really a, a conversation about what's the best tax play here. So kind of anticipating uh, future questions that you might have, I, I say I as an estate planning attorney and I do have a master's in tax law, so I understand uh, the tax code, but I don't do tax compliance. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. prepare tax returns. So. I always think it's valuable as the estate planning attorney to bring in a CPA and um, perhaps even uh, the client's financial advisor if they have one so that all of the uh, advisors are t collaborating on behalf of the mutual client because then I think we don't leave opportunities on the table, we don't leave money on the table, we've thought through what the potential tax fights might be and how do we mitigate those or eliminate them completely so that's what I would say, you know, that we ought to build a virtual team around us. And mm -hmm. that I think will help drive to a better result um, so that when death comes, the, uh, the business gets transferred to uh, the beneficiary in such a way that we've minimized the tax bite. And we've also protected uh, that enterprise from future lawsuits, et cetera. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. And I can see where we, we certainly want to bring the tax advisor into the loop all throughout. If we, if uh, say the, the, the son, daughter works at the business and is providing services, gets shares of stock, we certainly don't want to create taxable in income right. for that, for that uh, child through, you know, because they're also a service provider. Um, sure. And I, I don't know how that comes out. If you make a gift, you know, if you made a gift and they, they didn't provide services, I think you, you're pretty safe there. But if they're, if they're actually providing services, I, I don't know if that's a tax-free transaction or if that would be treated. Um, it's going to be a, it's a characterization challenge is what you're yeah. Gonna yeah. I mean, right now under the tax code, you can, gift up to $15,000 a year to mm -hmm. anybody. Yeah. And if uh, the, you know, and if it's here in California, mm -hmm. arguably the business, if it's dad started the business, you know, it's community property. Okay. Mm -hmm. So dad can give 15,000, mom can give 15,000. So I can get $30,000 up to that a, a year. And if the child is married and possibly has kids, then you can start, you know, doubling those gifts for each of those other people. And so you can start to move or start gifting out. Uh, the value of the business, but don't do this in a vacuum. Make sure that mm -hmm. we've brought in the accountant and perhaps even the financial advisor too. And we, everything that we do is a thought is thought through and it's considered. And then, you know, it, again, at, at the end of the day, I don't care what the client does. I just want them to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. So that's the, really the value of bringing together the team to be able to help advise and then let the client make the choice that works for him or her. 
I, I uh, hope that people are bringing you into the loop on uh, exit strategies on M&A transactions where they're going to sell the business to a third party buyer. Either sure. they're going to be acquired by a bigger company right. or a financial buyer or a serial entrepreneur. Some other buyer is going to come into the loop yeah. and, and, and acquire the business. So there's going to be a, a, a sum of money, financial assets to manage afterwards. And I certainly What's your role in, in that situation when you're working with the individual owner, their family, to try to coordinate with other members of the team? What do you do as, as the estate planning attorney? What's your role? And, and I handled a case like this uh, some years ago. We had, uh, um, it was a local company here in San Diego. A gentleman had helped found it a few, uh, some years before. I think he kicked in $1,000. And you know, it was a technology company. And uh, so he didn't take a salary for a number of years, but in any event, the way I got brought in was his financial advisor knew that he needed to get a living trust in place because he was married and had a couple of kids, but had no estate planning. And so we thought, okay, well, and he said, I'm looking to sell a company. I might either sell it this year, possibly next year. And I said, okay, well, you know, let's at least get your foundational plan in place. And then as you work toward getting uh, the sale done, then we can do the pre-merger transaction uh, or the pre-merger planning is what I should say. And so anyway, um, he, you know, what we did was we did the, we set it up in such a way that we move the stock of the company out of his ownership and his business wife's ownership because it's here in California, many property applies, et cetera. And so we didn't handle the M&A side of it, but although a, a really good M&A firm was involved, but they handled the M&A side of things, we just were brought in to do the, um, the pre-merger planning, uh, the mm -hmm. estate planning, sure. uh, and also some of the business planning too. We wanted to make sure that stock was out of their estates and that we put them into special trusts. And it was drafted in such a way that even though uh, each of the husband and the wife had given away their shares of stock, uh, they still had access to what they gave away. So it was kind of being able to eat your cake and have it too. So um, that's really what I would see my role doing is doing that pre-merger planning mm -hmm. and then letting in, in, the, in coordination with the other um, professionals, the, uh, the, the CPA and uh, the attorneys working on the M&A. I don't do M&A. Uh, that's a whole skill set that I don't have and am not interested in developing. Right. And to say there was a really good attorney handling all that for them. So that was a, a good, uh, a good collaborative uh, experience. And that's, you know, again, I, I stress that I hope the clients will uh, just not try to do this in a vacuum, you know, um, and, and really, yeah. I, I think David, to your point, uh, you know, it, it's working together for the benefit of the client and, I always tell people, you know, don't go cheap on this stuff. I mean, please don't do that because you think you might be saving a few pennies here or there. Good uh, uh, professional services providers are worth what you're going to pay them for what they're going to allow you to keep and uh, to realize from the sale or the transfer of the business. So don't go cheap on that. You know, um, just hire the best people you can. They should pay for themselves. Absolutely. I mean, there should be a return on that investment. It's just, you know, it, 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 and I, I get it. The way they build a business was because they were penny pinchers and they were frugal. I get that. Mm -hmm. But now is not the time, especially when you're selling your business for, let's say, an unreasonable value, as one of our colleagues likes to say. I think it's valuable to just spend the money on good professional services and have them help you, allow them to help you. Um, achieve uh, what's so important because this we're, we're probably talking about once in a lifetime money. Absolutely. Twice in a lifetime if you're really lucky, but really for most people, it's once in a lifetime money. You'd be interested to know I had a, 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 a few months ago on, on my podcast, I had an excellent ed exit advisor, Patrick Ungashik, and yeah. he, he quarterbacks the whole process and he, it's not any particular aspect of the transaction he he works with all the other advisors and works with with business owners to help them select the best way to exit their business not just going down an m a path or not and any particular strategy pick the right one and and carry out the 
And I asked him because he, there's so many different disciplines involved in okay. a sale of a business. W which one do you feel like you do the most? And he said, estate planning. I feel like really? I work the most like an estate planning attorney okay. because that's, that's really the way he's looking at this. At the end of the day, what's increasing your net worth the most by making this exit at the right time for you and at the right form for you? Sure. And if you're if you've if you've got you know wealth, or you, if, what way are you leaving this for your heirs? Either right. in, you know in the in the business altogether as a going concern, or sure. selling it and having. So, the the estate planning attorneys are necessary for business owners. They're necessary for everybody. But if if you're a business owner and and you haven't got a, a top tier estate plan, you're really selling yourself short. Yeah, it's got to be drafted, and I please stay. And, and I'm, again, I'm not here to badmouth anybody, but you know, legal Zoom is probably not the, you know, the the option or, or the choice that you want to be making. You know, uh, find a find somebody who does estate planning, does it regularly, so they're really good at it. They're very up on what the law is, etc., uh, and work with that person and make sure that they help you work through whatever the issues are, especially when it comes to your business, because. You know, um, if, if you're, you're going to transition that business after you pass on, or let's say you're getting ready to sell it. And in the example I was uh, referencing earlier, uh, this gentleman sold his business. There were a total of four partners. I worked with two of the four. Uh, they sold it to a major Bay Area technology company, which you can probably guess what it is. And it was for really life-changing money. And uh, they wanted the technology. So... And what happened was uh, they had probably delayed more than they should have. I met the gentleman in April of the year, and then by September, they wanted to sell. They just signed a term sheet. So, you know, and what they were told is most of our transactions take 60 to 75 days to close. Yours will go a lot more quickly. So, you know, we had to jump into action and get everything drafted, and, you know, and, and, and we coordinated with the um, M&A attorneys and all the other players. But it's interesting that Patrick would say that, that he's really focused, or even though he doesn't do that, I believe, he's really takes that on as kind of his role to kind of make sure all of that is coordinated. Very interesting. He, he was clear to say that I'm not any one of those, but if, if there's any aspect of, of what they do that's similar to what I do and the way that I look at this, it's probably the estate planning attorney. But let me test the similarity between your services. If you've got a business owner, and how much time would you say is the minimum in advance of their exit that you need to start working with them to, to lay, get their ducks in a row so they'll yeah. properly be able to do it? That's a great question. And it's going to, I mean, I've got colleagues, and you know, uh, you, you've got them too, who would like, and what they do is they work on exit strategy planning. Mm -hmm. Um, now, sometimes uh, life happens, you know, someone has passed on. The, the patriarch who built the business, he's out of the picture. You know, that's going to have to happen sooner than later. You're going to have to transition that business. Maybe mom is unable to do it or, or did, never knew what to do. And uh, the kids aren't interested. It was dad's thing and he just built this great business doing it. Uh, or someone's become incapacitated mentally, maybe as a result of an injury or a disease. So now, you know, everything has sped up. You have to do something quickly. Uh, but barring those things, I, what I hope is that clients will come to us with at least some lead time. Months would be preferable, and in some cases, years might even be better. I know one of my colleagues here in town, you know, would like to have, you know, conversation three to five years before the exit. That's fabulous if people you can get people to think in three to five year, you know, outlooks, but um, usually they don't do that. So now it's a matter of, well, given the timeline you've got and what we've got to work with, you, you know, you take your clients as you find them and you just work with them as best you can to try to help achieve what's important to them. So, you know, I, I mean, if I could have more time, and in fact, uh, for the one example I shared with you where uh, the gentleman had sold his company to a major Bay Area player, um, we, we had to do some uh, valuation of the shares of stock of the company that was going to be acquired. 
and uh, one of our local colleagues did the, the valuation for discounting purposes because we're trying to squash down the value of that stock and push it out of their estate. Um, he said, I'm not going to chide you about this. I know that they kind of delayed on getting this thing going, but gosh, if we could have even had even a couple of months or even a month more of a head start, there's a lot more we could have done. I said, I hear you loud and clear. And I dripped on him from April all the way to September, just once a month checking in. And then finally in September, they signed the term sheet, we're ready to go. So you just, you do the best you can under the circumstances. But if I had my druthers, uh, more time rather than less is always what I'd ask for. Yeah. You've seen situations with business owners that are done properly, where, where sure. you know, properly planned and executed on an exit. And I'm sure you have seen the wreckage from those that did not plan. Considering the, the, the vast array of, of situations in between the two, and considering that a lot of people, there's only so many hours in the day, and we all have limits in our budget about what we can do properly, what one thing would you advise that business owners make sure that they've properly taken care of with their advisors of any sort, either the state planning attorney, their tax advisor? Gosh, that's a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I'm just limited to the one. Mm. Yeah. Or, or think of, you know, yeah. what the problems uh, you've seen and how could those have been avoided? You know, I, I got to go back to my own experience. You know, mm -hmm. anytime I can get a, keep a client out of probate court, that's, mm -hmm. a, that, okay. to me, that's a win. Yeah. Probate just takes time. It costs money. It's a matter of public record. And in California, where I am, the uh, attorney's fees are statutory. So mm -hmm. on a $1 million home, the statutory probate attorney's fees on that would be $23,000 just for that one piece of property. Mm -hmm. And the personal representative gets a like amount of money. So already on a $1 million piece of property, and forget what the net value is or what the equity is, we're looking at the fair market value. You're spending 46,000, call it 5% of just that value of the property. And so it's, it's just, it, you know, it's so unnecessary and it's so easy to get this taken care of. Clients would just simply make you know, resolve to, to get it done. Like this, and much is the same, you know, when they get ready to sell their business, you know, just, you know, make the decision. We're going to do this the right way because we don't know how much time that we have realistically. But gosh, you know, if we can get out ahead of this, and set it up the right way whenever your time comes or whenever you want to transition is a lot better than if you hadn't done anything at all or if you delayed too late to get started to do something. So if I can encourage clients to do anything is get that estate plan in place, transfer the stock of the corporation or the membership interest into the trust. So now the surviving spouse can, as the trustee, do whatever is necessary to wrap all that up or sell it or whatever needs to be done. And then you avoid the probate um, of all these, or, you know, because if we're a community property state, have to file the spousal property petition to confirm the deceased spouse's half of the community property in, those, in the stock or the LLC interest to him or her, whoever the survivor is. You know, I would just always encourage that. The other stuff can be done uh, in, in due course, but, uh, and also let's talk for a moment, you know, we're filming this now during the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. So having a good healthcare directive and a good HIPAA mm -hmm. authorization, those are great documents to have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, I mean, we hope that none of us has to go to the hospital, especially during a time like this. But if we've got a good plan in place and we've got those two documents, that can make it a lot easier for the family than they have to rather, you know, if you didn't have them, now they've got to make those gut-wrenching decisions what would mom or dad have wanted? Because we never talked about it, uh, or I think we did talk about it, but I can't remember exactly what they wanted and nothing's written down. And You know, it just, it makes, it just takes all the guesswork out, that's what I'm saying. So if I have any bias, it's gonna be for the estate plan. Get the estate plan done, and for the business, put the stock or the membership interest of the LLC into uh, the trust so that it can flow through the trust and the surviving spouse is the successor trustee or mom and dad perish in a common disaster, heaven forbid, then the successor trustees could be the kids, you know, the adult children. They can now deal with that without having to go through probate court, which is a necessary evil. 
but gosh, it's so much easier to do this ahead of time and get the assets taken care of that way. I hope that's a helpful uh, description. Absolutely, yeah. Have you got any other words of wisdom based on all of your experience that you would want to share today with business owners to, to set them on the right way here? Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's a great question. I would say this, um, especially if someone, uh, you know, don't think that, you know, it, it, we're, I know we're all busy people and, and I get that. And if you're running a business, there's just not enough hours in the day. You're working nights, you're working weekends and you have no family life, et cetera. It, it can be, it can feel overwhelming, but I just encourage people, you know, meet with an advisor. Okay. And there are various groups that can provide guidance on how to select a good advisor. Um, just, but you know, get, get started down that pathway. I mean, be responsible because now you've got a business and you've got employees possibly. You've got uh, consumers, people who are relying upon your service or your product. So these are important considerations. You know, I mean, otherwise you would just go work for somebody and get your you know, paycheck every two weeks and hopefully you, you know, to, you know contribute to a, a retirement plan, but you know, you went into business for yourself. And so there's a value in doing that. Let's do it the right way. So I can't encourage people enough, you know, get good advice and don't be afraid to spend money. I mean, obviously be a smart shopper, you know, compare, but you know, don't, don't uh, cheap out on getting good advice because it can make a measurable difference in the uh, results that you'll achieve for yourself and for your family later on. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. And it's always amazing with the, the percentage of, of a small business owner's net worth that's wrapped up in the business that they want to invest just a little bit more money to protect it. And um, you certainly need to. Um, it's indispensable. They need to find advisors early on who they trust to give them the best advice and that they don't have to they don't have to second guess the advice they're getting. Yeah. And, and listeners, Rod Hatley is one of those attorneys who you can trust. He loves his work. He knows what he's talking about. He cares about his clients and, and, and the people who know Rod know that as well. So Rod, it was great to have you on the show. I really appreciate your time and you sharing all of this wisdom with our listeners out there. It's been an absolute honor to spend time with you today, David. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, with that, this is Selling Your Business with David King. And I'm going to sign off. All of you stay healthy out there, be well, and we will speak with you next time.